Welcome, my name is Katrin Huber. I'm an artist and professor in fine art at Newcastle University. I initiated Expanded Interiors, um, the project, and developed three large-scale site-responsive installations for two Roman houses at the World Heritage Sites of um, Herculaneum and Pompeii. They were exhibited there between 2018 and 2019. Now I had the fantastic opportunity to restage these installations here in Newcastle at the Hutton Gallery in the summer of 2021. To provide context, I will briefly talk about the project in Italy before moving on to the expanded interiors um, restage exhibition here at the Hutton Gallery. A late afternoon in February, the sun low on the horizon, its parallel rays pouring into the small vestibule in the west wing of the Villa di Mistri. Painted yellow bricks and panels are radiating warmth, saturating the room in an enveloping glow. This now is the threshold between the cool northeastern parts of the villa, bathed in reflections of lush green gardens, and the light saturated and heated reception rooms to the west. Rooms in which walls open up, architecture expands in glorious paintings, weaving inside and outside, profane and sacred, and public and private realms. When I first visited Herculaneum and Pompeii in 2008 as an Abbey Fellow at the British School at Rome, I was struck by how these decorations seem to respond to light, volumes, phys the physical nature of the houses, how some choreographed whole houses encoded messages and had a very complex way of combining real and imagined worlds. Representation and matter were combined in ever-changing variations and complexities. I was gripped by these wall paintings and wanted to find out more about them, but also why they seemed so to be speaking so pressingly to me as a contemporary artist. Here in these images from the Casa di Cervi, the house of the stacks at Herculaneum, you can see how wonderful a house is decorated through different wall decorations and different color schemes as well. I developed different approaches then through artistic practice, through making, trying to find out more um, about Roman wall paintings. One way of questioning started through a fictional conversation between three historical artists, which I wrote. The artists, artists were a woman Roman wall painter, whose name sadly we do not know, Elisitsky, the Russian avant-garde artist, as Devil's Artwork, and the German artist Kurt Schwitters. They discussed their respective practices and what they bring to contemporary work. It's an evolving dialogue. Um, I was very interested in these three artists because I think they were quite pivotal um, for in, in their role for installation art. So we see here the Merzbau by Schwitters, where he transformed the apartment of his parents in this ever-evolving um, installation. Elisitsky's Kabinett der Abstrakten um, from 1926, and then an example of the Roman wall painter. I'll come back to this conversation um, later on in the talk. Uh, I also developed uh, site responsive work for, um, for a series of venues, for a range of venues here, Petzhanger Manor's um, in London, which was Sir John Zorn's country residency, and um, also as a buff so below for the Hutton Gallery in 2013. I'll talk a little bit more about this exhibition later on. Nonetheless, I still felt I'm just scratching the surface and that I really had to investigate specific houses and specific wall paintings um, if I want to find out more about these works. We're better to do that lab in Herculaneum and Pompeii. This led me to set up an interdisciplinary research project, expanded interiors, bringing together artists and archeologists. We worked um, with the Casa de Crypto Portico in Pompeii and the Casa del Bel Cortile in Herculaneum. 
one of the houses we worked with here is the uh, house of the crypto particles. It's um, decorated in the second style. The underground section, it looks like it's all done by the same workshop, which was also quite important. Uh, here you see a painted colonnade with a Trojan frieze um, in, in the underground passageway. It looks on first view like um, very repetitive, um, but it is a, this is, is a very irregular scheme. The perspective is quite flat and the painted frieze adds images seamlessly at the top. So it's really um, a space which sort of pulls you along and was meant for the viewer to walk through. This brings you to um, this room here at the top, which was um, a dining room with, where the visitor would spend time, recline, dine. Um, in terms of perspective, this is much more refined. You have here the karyatids, uh, sort of really three-dimensionally in front of the painted wall, whilst here the herms are very much integrated into the wall. And instead of a continuous frieze, you've got these individual paintings here. Um, beautiful, this room is, beautifully in, inversed in terms of color. So you can see here in the, in the underground passage where you've got the cupboard mortem um, as the main color in the background, which is here part of the frieze at the top, whilst this beautiful warm uh, ochre yellow um, from the herms becomes here the main part of the, of the wall. So there's a beautiful play on colors. This culminates into this um, beautiful um, and very complex uh, bathroom. Uh, here, inside and outside, mundane and sacred and private and private and public space are intertwined and combined with more complexity. And there is an even more complex play with the scarp color schemes. Uh, for me, most importantly, uh, this scheme is very complex in relationship to perspective, combi combining multiple perspectival viewpoints to wrap the room around the visitor who would spend time in the space. Don't miss um, the really beautiful abstract mosaic on the floor here. Um, the sort of archaeological and artistic research done in within the house and um, my subsequent work in my studio space allowed me to develop large scale site responsive painting installations, which were very much in dialogue with uh, the decorations in this house. The installation responded to the rhythm and movement of the Roman wall paintings, the tension between actual and imagined architecture, and the play between two-dimensional and three-dimensional space within the cryptoparticles. Its composition is based on an irregular rhythm of opened and closed spaces that at times seems to almost collapse into itself, together with a playful and changing pattern of color relations and functions. These are very much paintings which fold and unfold spaces, paintings that pull you along and through. The painting installation incorporated 3D printed Roman face cups, which linked really beautifully, uh, which linked to the beautiful depictions of the faces of the herms within the painted colonnade of the underground passageway. Um, I find these are really beautifully expressive and tender uh, portraits with a very sort of dreamlike atmosphere. I was captured by these, by the Roman face cups. I felt by how fresh and humane and humorous and contemporary they seem. Um, we 3D printed them in silver IBS, um, a material which sort of allowed me to store even more disconnect them from their Roman context and to, to allow me to integrate them into the exhibition. The second installation at the Casa de Cripto Portico was aligned with the beautiful bathroom you saw earlier. 
like the Roman bathroom, this installation incorporated multiple viewpoints. It enveloped the viewer um, and suggested a sort of centrifugal and intense movement. The space comes at you in parts and was meant to be um, very intense. Here you can see the house of the beautiful courtyard in Herculaneum, which is another really gorgeous and dramatically orchestrated house. You can see here the small um, narrow entrance space. You're guided through a tiny filter space into this light filled and beautiful courtyard. And from there, if you turn right, um, you come into this um, for its time, unusually large and warm, beautiful reception room. So there's a real play on color temperatures, but also volumes within the house. This house was excavated by the archeologist and director of the site at the time, Amadeo Mayuri, who used this very reception room as a museum in which he brought objects from all over the site together. His approach to curating was controversial though. He, for example, um, combined objects from different houses, a loom from one house with, the, with a bed from another, which then became the house of the girl with the loom. This is from an archeological view, viewpoint, of course, a dubious, but from an artistic curatorial view, this use of narrative is quite fascinating. The, my installation here echoes the more ornamental and shallow space within these uh, late third, early fourth style wall paintings. The replicas of the statues of Roman women sit here, either in sculptural form or as prints, sit very much on the edge of the construction, like um, the painted objects in the Roman wall paintings, which sit very much between the painted imaginary space and the actual real space. Here, statues of Roman women are taken out of context and brought together into a new conversation. We have these remains, for example, of an anonymous female figure, which might have been a bust of an ancestor or part of a furniture. This here is Isis Lactans, an Egyptian god, goddess nurturing her son. Um, she would have been found um, on a household altar together with deities of different origins. I think um, it shows a, a really powerful depiction of breastfeeding. And here we can see from behind at the top, but also the sculpture and two more images here. Livia, wife of Augustus, a powerful woman at the time, um, her statue is heavily damaged by the catastrophe of the Vesuvius eruption, but it seems her integrity is very much intact. The installation also played um, very much with language. I cut quite brutally these letters into the printed panels. Um, they refer to context and the framing of the site post-excavation. They spell out the word Bella Ciao, and um, Bella Ciao was an Italian anti-fascist song. Mayuri and his team, they did of course a great job in excavation, Hercu excavating Herculaneum, a site buried under up to 20 meters of ashes and debris. However, it has to be mentioned that he benefited very much from the funding from a fascist regime. At the time, that was, of course, keen to use the Roman heritage for their own propaganda purposes. Here you see again um, the three installations in Italy within the Roman houses. I should say that it was crucial for me that the installation operate at, as independent artworks in different contexts almost as if they become portals or reagents that connect or collide different time zones, cause or create new contexts and raise new questions. So reagents here is a sort of installation that is added to a system to cause um, a reaction. 
Hence, it was a really fantastic opportunity to restage this exhibition at the Hutton Gallery last summer. It allowed me to work with the successions of room in a building and organization with its own rich history, to hopefully create a dramatic choreography of spaces that are interconnected and provoke meaning while hopefully building up complexity. I wanted uh, for the exhibition to incorporate multiple voices to be um, polyphone. So there is this, uh, my fictional conversation with these different characters. This is also animated by actor Marie Jane Wells um, for the virtual reality. There's also a text by art historian, art historian, Dr. Fiona Anderson as part of the VR. I integrated Coach Witters Merz on wall into the exhibition. And we have, of course, um, Rosie Morris's uh, beautiful installation, the commission uh, for expanded in interiors restaged. So each of the galleries um, has a quote from my fictional Roman war painter to frame that particular exhibition. Here you see uh, the juxtaposition of along and through exhibited on the left in the Roman houses and here on the right um, in the Hutton Gallery. The, for me important was that the installation becomes a different work. It is much more theatrical here. You can see the back first and it is very sculptural. It also has, you can see all, um, the, the traces of its journey um, here on the back, inscribed on the back of the exhibition. And for me, it was really important that that is exposed. The installation cuts through the beautiful exhibition space at the Hutt Hutton Gallery. And I think it strangely becomes like a dislocated ruin in itself, a kind of activated fragment. The installation emphasizes, I think, the wideness of the gallery space, a wideness that was wrongly associated with antique sculptures and antique architecture, um, which I, I think um, uh, this is sort of wideness of imagined antique built environment and form, but which in fact um, was, that environment was in fact really colorful and vibrant. So it's almost like two different conceptions and interpretations or interpretations of the antique collide here. Again, there's a succession of opened and closed spaces. There's a play on the false doors motif. Um, for me here, referring to past, present and future and another sort of time dimension as also was mentioned in the quote for the gallery. I um, talked earlier about the play, playful change of color relations with installation, within the installations. And here I would like to emphasize also the use of black as a color in within Roman wall painting. Black was used really sumptuously um, in the houses and there was often a play on different surface qualities and temperatures like warm, cold, blacks, glossy or matte surfaces. Um, this corner here um, is, is very much, uh, the dominant color is black and it's very um, high in contrast with light and dark colors. It was originally shown in a very shadowy um, part of the underground passageway, hence the, the intense con contrast. But I'm really happy that in the hut and it was really bathed in light from the ceiling dome and also from the bay window on the side. The installation reflects the beautiful um, Georgian architecture of the Hutton Gallery. And um, I also hope that the face cups here have a different, hopefully even more humorous and independent, independent life um, at the Hutton Gallery.
So here's another view of the back of the installation. It almost looks a bit like a shipping container, sort of quite brutally um, intersecting the exhibition space on the one side. On the other side, you have this quite beautiful reflection of the light and space of the Hutton within the aluminium panels. So there's a I think a strange tension between the installation blending into its background while at the same time brutally cutting through the space. A question um, which uh, I raised in the interpretation leaflet uh, within this space was, was what hidden histories mingle in these breathing walls? What relationships are forged? From this light-filled exhibition space, you move into gallery two and come into a dark space that holds a room within the room. First, however, you are confronted with another aluminium wall right into your face. Again, the theme here is theatricality, um, a theme of disguising and revealing, of looking behind the scenes. You have to walk around the installation first, and um, on that way you encounter this small corner piece, here, um, which is called the corner escape. It ex I hope that it activates the corner through its shifting perspective when you walk along, along this um, piece. So this unfolds over the corner, again, revealing and disguising space. Shadows of plants overgrow the art architecture hinting at the space beyond the image, at the space that we cannot see. And for me, it was also important that vegetation is taking over. White, the color white was quite important here to be um, emphasized as, as a color in itself, which is also part of the big installation you'll see in a moment. When you um, turn around from the corner escape, you are faced um, with this massive body of the room within a room, which seeps ominous red light from top and bottom. You walk around the installation and come to um, this installation, which is called Around and Up, which sort of demands a different movement uh, to along and through, which pulled you along. And here, this is a sort of more centrifugal um, spiraling movement. Again, this installation brings different perspectival viewpoints together to create an intensiveness and disorientation. It's um, a kind of attempt to create an embodied perspective and a, to create a painting that really wraps around the viewer. I wanted to show you um, some models as well. These are two models I used in uh, creating the installation around and up. Um, but I also worked with models, models of the gallery space and the installations themselves when thinking about the curation of the exhibition. Um, here you see uh, originally the orientation of the space was a different one, but also the wall, the wallpaper was a lot larger. Here you can see then, um, more the, the final light, la, um, layout of the gallery space. So you come here from gallery one and you have to walk around here to get into uh, the room within a room. Um, there, uh, I, I had a question um, as well from my interpretation leaflet. Do different times meet like walls at an angle? Will the vegetation of tomorrow feast on the ruins of today? From this space, uh, one walked on to come to Kurt Schwitter's Merzbahnwall, again a fictional quote here from Schwitter's himself, well, a fictional quote, binds, um, binds in this dislocated site responsive piece into the expanded interiors restage exhibition. I wanted to quickly show you um, images of the exhibition as above, so below, where I could create a temporary home for Schwitter's Merzbahnwall. You can see I was already sort of testing through my interest in, in Roman wall paintings. Here I worked with these uh, scaled up collages uh, I did, sort of organic collages, which become part of um, 
the architecture here. The title as above, so below, comes from alchemy, Trismegistus emerald tablets, and refers very much to the relationship between planets and the growth of metals on Earth. Like, for example, sun was associated with gold, the moon with silver. But um, that relationship also refers um, to the relationship within architecture to negotiate between the micro and macrocosm. We move on from here to um, Rosie Morris's commission for expanded interiors restage in Out of This World in Gallery 3. Gallery 3 was actually the first gallery you came in and then Gallery 1, Gallery 2. And um, Rosie Morris was a research assistant on the original expanded interiors project and she was commissioned uh, by myself to do this commission for, for expanded interiors, so to create her own artistic response to the research that we did in Italy. You are led into Rosie's space by what she calls dancing diamond dashes here on the left. Around the walls of the space are these large, enlarged soft panel drawings with very rich and warm colors. Close up, you can see um, the porosity and physicality of these drawings. Light was, um, of course, very important um, for Rosie's work as well. And uh, light comes here through three openings on one side of the installation, starting here with um, the curtain, an oil painting of a curtain that filters through the light from the unseen outside. From this piece, you move on to um, child heights and you find there um, a diorama. This, open up, this opens up a much more psychedelic, psychedelic psych psychological space, sorry, much more psychological space. Um, you see this upside down tree here. It could be uh, the roots or the tree top top or, by, or both breaking through the ceiling. You have this abandoned rocking horse here in the back, aiming for a sort of half opened door in, in the background and the light seeping um, into this space and um, through the ceiling, but also the back walls. The, the motif of the half open door is picked up um, in this small print where light again spills into a room through a doorway. We are guided around the room by these gestural drawings on the enlarged um, pastel drawings. Um, they show sort of the reflections of light around the room. And uh, we find on the opposite wall, this um, indication of a fireplace and a hearth with its sort of ideas of home and hearth and places for gathering. If we turn around, we are back to the threshold piece um, of the diamond dancing dashes. And here we see also light reflecting seemingly from the openings on the right hand side and slowly moving um, over this, um, over the diamond diamond lines at the back of the space. So there's a different space if you turn around um, in the exhibition. Gallery four um, was the last gallery in the exhibition, um, Light Trap. It focuses on light, all things light, dissolving light, but equally important, um, light's companion shadow. First, I show you again a juxtaposition between uh, the installation in Italy and the house of the beautiful courtyard and here on the left at the Hutton Gallery. Uh, the scaffolding-like construction here, Bella Ciao, um, you find the women again in their conversation, but here they're even more removed um, from their original context. I was really looking forward to see the installation in a contemporary a gallery space. Uh, 
I um, mentioned earlier these printed panels here that reveal and disguise these figures and spell out or inscribe the word Bella Ciao. The, uh, just to remind you the title of the um, Italian anti-fascist song. I also mentioned Amedeo Maiuri's, Maiuri and his sort of unorthodox approach to creating his particular way of telling stories um, that has become quite in interesting for me, also thinking about how to use narrative within, an, with the curation, within the curation, narrative and storytelling within the curation of the exhibition. Here, uh, the work was anchored to the space by monochrome wall hangings made out of fabric rich tactile fabrics that catch light and reflect it very differently depending on from where one is looking at them. They very much change um, when you walk along them. The wall hangings depict architecture. I think they could be ruins. I see them as ruins actually as well. Overgrown again or overcast by shadows of plants. Their tangible and physical intensity is important to me and the way how light mingles in the crevices of material. These works have astronomical names, like this one is called Black Hole. There's also a white dwarfs, asteroids and so on. And again, the connection between micro and magma crossing in relation to architecture and nature is important to me here. Light and shadows are also central to the virtual reality work, the 3D real-time environment that one, can, that one can navigate via a game console. Uh, we have light here from the projection flickering in the exhibition space, so the projected light, but also light and shadow are very crucial within the virtual space. VR here is not just a documentation, um, but work in itself. You, you, um, you have different rooms like uh, the room in Herculaneum and also uh, the underground passageway in Pompeii. Here you see a still from when, when um, you see the space um, as a point cloud, like a scanner sees it. But really um, you can see also the work itself in the exhibition space and light and shadow become very more prominent and, and animate this space very much. So the, the, we simulated how the light would, um, the sun would change um, and the light would change um, across a day, but also across the, across the year. The walls are also animated. We opened them up. I worked together with um, two developers uh, from Animersion, who is a partner in the project. And so we made these, um, these walls, uh, the, the 3D architecture within the wall paintings became through physically 3D and also the walls became partially um, translucent. So I'll show you a little bit how the light changes within, within um, the VR. So they're quite dramatic shifts. And here you can see um, the installation as part of the VR, but also um, as part of the real exhibition environment. I should say that um, audio was quite important, uh, an important element uh, within the real time environment, the virtual one, of to slow down uh, perception and to slow down um, the visitors. It was, um, so it contained a text by art historian Dr. Fiona Anderson, but also my fictional conversation um, I mentioned earlier. So Light Trap, not the VR work, but the whole gallery space, used light in very different ways, be it in the real-time environment of the gallery space, mingling in the crevices of materials or casting shadows, being static or ephemeral or, or ever moving. I was really interested in this magic between light space and time. I was talking about different voices at the beginning 
And I should really talk here about our work with the Link Group, that's Hutton and Lyons Art Galleries Group for Young Adults. The group followed expanded interiors restage from the beginning, and they developed and designed their own Young People's Guide to the exhibition, offering a very different approach towards the work, research, and exhibition. And it was very popular and a fantastic, a fantas fantastic guide to the exhibition. I wanted to quickly show you also our um, second interpretation guide, which uh, shows a map here through the gallery. You came in here, then you walked through Rosie's space, then through Maya Long and through Gallery Two, Schwitter Smerzbahn, and then Gallery Four. Um, we this leaflet um, featured creative text here by the respective artists. So myself writing about um, my galleries and Rosie about her gallery. Um, in summary, it was really exciting to relocate expanded interiors to the Hatton Gallery. It allowed me to work with different notions of time, be it within the work and how it is experienced, but also within the gallery space and context of the Hatton Gallery. It was an exciting opportunity to reflect and expand upon, upon the original project, to forge new relationship and investigations, to ask new questions, to embrace new contexts. It allowed me to incorporate the research process more directly directly to work with the notion of an escalating sequence of rooms to include narratives while juxtaposing physical and digital real-time environments. It is really exciting um, for me to see how this installation can forge new relationships within these new contexts and exhibition spaces. Um, and as I said earlier, how these installations from Herculaneum and Pompeii operate like reagents. I see them as strangely evolving and escalating work. And for me, it is exciting to see where this installation could, can go next. And I'd love to see it develop in different contexts, building up hopefully complexity. A big thank you here goes to our funders, the Arts and Humanity Research Council and Newcastle University, um, and our partners, of course, especially the Hutton Gallery. Here in particular, I would like to thank um, Zoe Allen, Hazel Baron Cooper, uh, Julie Mel, but everyone involved. It was really fantastic working with you. And also to Animersion, our digital media partners um, who are based in Middlesbrough. I want to finish my talk here with a quote from my Roman wall painter. She says, I think what our Roman practice brings to this discussion is firstly complexity. That is how our art articulated a whole building in a layered yet coherent way. And secondly, a trust and belief in the visual and intellectual capacities of the audience and a recognition that challenging them is good. To finish with the motto, like my male colleagues, complexity, difficulty, and multi-layeredness is the key to the future. Thank you.